Good evening. My name is Marie Stoner, and I want to welcome you to our series, Brain Health Conversations. I'm talking to you tonight in my role as Chief Science Officer of Activate Brain and Body to tell you about the possibility of buffering your brain against the decline of aging and even the strong evidence for modifying the risk of being diagnosed with cognitive disease and delaying the onset of symptoms. This is explained by a concept called cognitive reserve. And this is my topic for tonight, cognitive reserve, a theory developed by researchers to explain the mystery that some people have the ability to tolerate damage to their brain without losing function. Basically, tonight is a science mystery story. To explain cognitive reserve, I need to go back to the 1980s when National Institute of Health started to pile a lot of money into brain research, started to gather a lot of data on brain on people's cognitive function, and in particular, Alzheimer's disease, which was starting to replace cancer as the most dreaded disease. At that time, and officially until now, cognitive decline and Alzheimer's disease are diagnosed solely by clinical symptoms. Let me explain that. That's unlike most any other disease you can think of, a heart, lung, stomach. You go in with a disease of those organs and the doctor will ask you your clinical symptoms, but then they want to examine the organ directly. They poke it, they prod it, they scope it, they biopsy it. But they can't do that with the brain. They couldn't do it then. They really can't yet do it. That's because the brain has what is called the blood brain barrier, which is a high risk to cut into. So unless there is an urgent medical need, the brain is left alone. It's not examined. Currently, they're trying to find some ways to look inside the brain with scans and even some blood tests, but nothing has been validated. Instead, with the brain, the doctor only looks at symptoms and will consider mental status symptoms as a way of diagnosing. Uh, on the left, you see an example of one of the most widely used mental status exams called the MOCA, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. So this is the scoring sheet. So up here, you see three animals, name the animals. Later, the patient will be asked to remember the animals. Here is a trail you have to follow, 1A, 2B, draw the shape. And to the right, you see the clock drawing, asked to draw a clock uh, showing 10 after 11. Uh, I don't know if you can see. <laughs> um, my face is sort of over the Alzheimer's clock, but here is a picture of a healthy clock. And in the Alzheimer's, the person really loses orientation. And down here are scores for a number of other cognitive, uh, cognitive assessments. So uh, doctors use this kind of assessment. They'll probably also interview a family member or friend. And depending on these results, a patient is given a level of severity, no impairment, mild, moderate, or severe. This is what is meant by a clinical diagnosis. It's based on function alone. When somebody with Alzheimer's dies and an autopsy is done, this diagnosis can be confirmed by seeing the brain damage. 
And the slide you're looking at now is an illustration of damage in the brain. So let me show you the roadmap here. This is a neuron, an illustration of a neuron. Uh, and neurons connect in networks. And so these axons and dendrites are connecting the neurons to each other. The orange balls are plaques. And you may have heard of plaques and tangles. That's in the news a lot as a uh, hallmark of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, the truth of the matter is that plaques, tangles, and brain shrinkage are a part of normal brain aging. But in the Alzheimer's brain, it is severe. There are many, many plaques and tangles, which are, are illustrated by this black mass in here. The, the tangle is um, a protein within the neuron that is used to transport things within the neuron. And it's usually like, sort of like a train track uh, within the neuron. And in a diseased neuron, that tau protein collapses. And that's why it's called a tangle. So we have a diseased brain here with lots of plaques and what lots of tangles. And in the Alzheimer's brain that ends up killing off large numbers of neurons. What the researchers expect to find, and here's where the mystery starts to come in, is that that clinical diagnosis, the MOCA score, for example, will match the autopsy. If a patient is diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease clinically, they expect to see a large number of plaques and tangles in the brain if there is an autopsy. And if they find a large number of plaques and tangles in the brain, they expect that this patient will have a lot, would have had a lot of trouble cognitively before their death. Often that relationship does hold, but not all the time and not in a linear way. Starting in the 1980s, neurologists and researchers found a special subgroup that was the mystery that we're talking about tonight. A group who tested okay, their MOCA score, you can see that there's a, a cutoff score of 26 or uh, better. Their MOCA score was 26 or better and it, sometimes even well, like score very high, in spite of having a brain that looked like this, in spite of having a brain with significant damage. This was a subgroup of people who have the ability to tolerate damage to their brain without losing function. Let me tell you about one of the earliest studies. In 1986, a psychologist by the name of David Snowden convinced an order of nuns to participate in a prospective study, which is the kind of study where they follow people over time, keeping track of them. Uh, in this study, uh, they followed them over a number of years until their death, during which they had functional and cognitive assessments like the MOCA plus. They took a lot of assessments of these ladies and they agreed to have their brains autopsy. When they died, their cognitive symptoms at the last exam before death were compared to their autopsy results. And in the autopsy and Alzheimer's diagnosis is there's a kind of scale they use from zero to six with six being the most severe damage. My favorite nun in this study is Sister Bernadette. She's one of the study sisters who tested very well on all of her cognitive assessments, including the one right before her death where she scored uh, above average in memory. Not only did she score high, but the other nuns rated her as one of the sharpest in the convent. And in her last assessment before her death, she was able to tell the time within four minutes without a clock being present. I've tried it, I can't do it, it's pretty impressive. 
So after autopsy, the research team got together to match her last assessment with her autopsy, and they discovered a very large discrepancy between how she was functioning prior to death and the amount of damage in her brain. Here's a quote from Snowden. Tangles cluttered her hippocampus and her neocortex all the way up to her frontal lobes. It was worse than that illustration I showed you. Not only did she have stage six Alzheimer's disease, but she had two copies of the APOE4 gene, which gave her an increased risk for Alzheimer's disease. About one third of the nuns who tested stage five or stage six in their autopsies did not show the expected cognitive compromise before death. Meaning, and just to get our language clear, meaning that they were not diagnosed during their lifetimes and they died of something else. This was big news. And as you see, Time Magazine did a cover story on it in 2001. In one account I read somewhere else, the fact that Sister Bernadette enjoyed crossword puzzles was widely reported. And for a time, the sales of crossword puzzles went up. So since that time, since the Nun study, there have been um, numerous and still ongoing prospective studies, tracking people over time, looking at their autopsy results, comparing co cognitive function with the damage in the brain. And the research results vary, but there were always people who fit the Sister Bernadette uh, type of uh, subject uh, from 25% to 67% whose damage does not affect function. There were so many of them that researchers started to call them escapees. They escape the diagnosis. And this is where Yakov Stern comes in, who is the man who was back then starting to investigate these escapees. He proposed this concept of cognitive reserve, which is uh, our topic tonight to explain how some people cope better than others with the same amount of damage to the brain. He and other investigators started looking at these escapees to see what was different about them. What they found is really interesting. They found that it was the way they lived their lives that separated them from the people who didn't escape. Evidence is strong that the best way to build cognitive reserve is through choices that you make every day. An enriched environment is the centerpiece of a, a lifestyle change. From enriched environment creates this process of cognitive reserve. From mouse studies to human studies, the thing that appears to distinguish escapees from those who end up losing function and being diagnosed is what researchers do call this enriched environment. For mice, it's a cage with um, extra mazes and colorful tunnels and colorful running wheels. And for humans, it's a number of lifestyle choices that you do have control over to enrich your environment. According to Stern, an enriched environment builds this reserve that allows the brain to compensate for the damage by building stronger brain cell connections. There is damage but there are compensatory strong networks. So let's take a look at some of the lifestyle characteristics they found uh, that the escapee group had. At first, they looked backwards into their history and they, they did find that 
more years of education and more years of stimulating work did describe this group of escapees. But as they continued their research in these prospective studies going forward, they found independent strong evidence that midlife activities also build cognitive reserve. The one that has been researched the most and has the strongest support in terms of lifestyle changes is physical activity. So I'm just referencing one study here. This is uh, talking about a review study and a review study, what they do there is they take a bunch of studies, in this case, 11 studies, put all the results together and that gives it more weight than just one study. So combining the results of 11 studies showed that regular exercise can significantly reduce the rate, the risk, I imagine under my picture there, reduce the risk of developing dementia by about 30%. Remember, reducing the risk of developing dementia means reducing the risk of showing impairment during your lifetime, regardless of what's going on in your brain. For Alzheimer's disease specifically, the risk was reduced by 45%. Here are other environmental lifestyle things, things that are within your control that can be part of an enriched environment and, and positive results have been shown for them physical activity, social interaction, new and complex learning, and nutrition. The most important thing to understand about cognitive reserve, I believe, is that it's a result of many brain-friendly type activities, including all of these. A mistake that is often made in brain health products is to rely on just one thing, like one brain game or one supplement. That's a mistake. You need enrichment in all areas. Science tells us that healthy brains result from enrichment in all aspects of health. So, the big question, how does this happen? How does your lifestyle, these behaviors we're talking about, how do they build the reserve? What is the theory about how they build the reserve? And Stern and many, many others point to two things that happen in the brain that you may have heard about, neurogenesis and neuroplasticity. Now, I say a picture is worth a thousand words. Uh, so I've got two pictures, that's 2000 words, and I don't have time for 2000 words tonight. So I'm going to briefly explain each of these so that you can get this snapshot answer of uh, how this happens. It's really kind of remarkable. So on the left, you're seeing a mouse, a slice of a mouse brain, uh, and it's in the hippocampus. So this shows a part of the brain, a slice of brain function in a mouse. And these little pink globules coming down are actually new neurons, uh, immature neurons coming into uh, action. That's what neurogenesis is, birth of neurons. Research shows that active participation in an enriched environment, and that's especially physical activity, stimulates these new neurons coming on board and surviving. On the right is an illustration of neuroplasticity. That's the term used to describe the brain's ability to modify, change, and adapt throughout your lifetime in response to the environment. So just very quickly, you have about 80 billion neurons in there, and they don't operate alone. They operate in networks. They're always 
firing and wiring and connecting in the, into these networks, which you just see two neurons of. Networks that are stimulated get stronger. Networks that aren't stimulated get weaker. And that's the basis for neuroplasticity. And according to cognitive reserve, an enriched environment creates backup neurons for thinking, problem solving, and memory. So, the mystery is how does it happen that some people are able to defy their autopsy results? And the answer according to cognitive reserve is that they've, their brain has compensatory mechanisms to take over, to allow them to survive and thrive and function. So I've been talking to people about cognitive reserve for a while at Activate in my practice as a clinical psychologist with friends and with family. And everybody's excited to know that there's something they can do to keep their brain healthy. But then the question starts, well, I'm already 50. Uh oh, well, I'm already 60. And truth be told, cognitive decline starts in the 30s. So there's always this issue of, is it too late for me? It's sort of like we all wish we had started investing fully in our retirement funds at age 20, right? So the final story I'm going to tell you tonight is of a study from Finland. It's um, the FINGER study, uh, which stands for what you're reading here, the title here. And so just let me set up the study for you. It was a two year randomized controlled trial, which is the gold standard. And in order to participate, people had to be between 60 and 77 years old. The next criteria for conclusion I find really interesting. Uh, I hope this, I don't know if you can't see it. I can't. Okay, I'll try to read it. Inclusion criteria were cognitive performance at the mean level or lower than expected for age. So let's say, for example, on the MOCA, you saw that 27 or above was the cutoff. Uh, people had to be 27 or slightly below in order to participate in this study. What they mean, what that means is they specifically selected people who were at risk for crossing over that barrier where they were going to get diagnosed. I thought that was really clever. The, uh, they were separated into two groups, a intervention group and a control group and had what's called a multi-domain intervention. You now know that as an enriched environment. What did it include? physical activity, it was individualized, but they tried to get everybody up to like 45 to 60 minutes, three to five times a week of both aerobic and uh, strength training. There was a nutritional counseling. Uh, they had a, you know, the Mediterranean diet gets a lot of press for its brain healthiness, well-deserved. They have kind of the Nordic version of that, a lot of fish, fruit, vegetables and grapeseed oil instead of olive oil. Cognitive training or that cognitive stimulation, new and novel cognitive stuff was done through a computerized brain training. And uh, in this group, they had social activities, group social activities. There was also intensive monitoring and management of metabolic and vascular risk. So heart health was also part of the intervention. And that part of the intervention, the monitoring of metabolic and heart health was also done for the control group, but the control group did not get one to three. So let's see what happened. First of all, after 24 months, the control group was 30% more likely to be diagnosed. 
And the treatment group, remember, these were people who were at risk. The treatment group actually had improvements. They improved their processing speed, which is how quickly you kind of process and respond to the environment and uh, predictably slows down with aging. And they improved their executive functioning, which is an umbrella term for things like uh, working memory, flexible thinking, and self-control. So these multi-domain enriched environment intervention studies are coming more and more online in the research community because we really want to find a way to help people at risk, particularly, but really the whole population, um, you know, kind of keep, keep against the trajectory of their aging. At Activate, we've designed our own multi-domain enriched environment. I'd like to think of it as that. Uh, in our program, we've taken these five pillars, these enriched environmental lifestyle behaviors and put them together in an individualized program for each member. Uh, a focus on exercise, cognitive stimulation, stress management because the brain does not like cortisol, nutrition, and socialization. Last month, I did a, um, a webinar like this on, specifically on Activate's five pillars of brain health, going more specifically into the science behind each of them and how we have brought it into our programming. If you, um, I, I think Adam has told me that there, when this, this webinar is being recorded and will be sent out to all of you. And they're going to include a link to that webinar also. It'll give you a more expanded view of these lifestyle uh, variables that I'm talking about. So what are our takeaways for the talk? How do you become an escapee? It is possible to build a reserve of stronger and more flexible neural networks through modifiable lifestyle choices. You know, just knowing that uh, can help. You can sort of take a look around your own environment. How can you enrich it? You know, what's something new and different you can do? And make sure to have part of your enriched environment be physical activity. The best path to cognitive reserve is active participation in a diverse, enriched environment. And lastly, it's never too late. Uh, think about those fins. Uh, it's never too late to add to your store of cognitive reserve. So I want to thank you for your time and attention. And here uh, is all the ways you can get in touch with us. Uh, we really like hearing from people. Any questions you have, any comments you have, and especially if you would like um, to uh, reach out to discuss the Activate program opening up very soon uh, in Cincinnati. So thank you.